welcome to the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. I assume we're all in the right place. I just have a little bit of housekeeping to go over. Everybody should know that information for the course is on B course, in fact, and the syllabus is there, and I have an adjustment to the syllabus. There must have been information going around about how fabulous this class is, as in the participants in this class, because I have speakers clamoring to come and speak to you, and really fantastic speakers. So I wanted to give you a heads up. We have about four open dates on the syllabus, if you've noticed. Uh, there are two dates in October and two dates in November. So keep an eye out this week, because I believe we'll be filling the two of those dates. All right? Any questions on that? OK. Then it is truly my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is a number of things, including a Cal grad. Uh, but in my interactions that I've had with him, above all, he is one thing, and that is passionate about whatever he does. And he does a lot. He is a serial entrepreneur, and perhaps you've heard other people called a serial entrepreneur, but not like this gentleman. He recently founded Combustion Ventures. It's a consumer technology incubator. And finally, he is, I think, putting a process in place about, around this kind of stuff that he has done for 20 years, uh, just automatically, and now he's putting it into his accelerator. He grew his company, bookrenner.com, now called Rafter, from, as I understand it, $1 to over 60 million over four years. He is a sought after advisor and board member for companies like Cafe Press. If you have ever had a t-shirt or a mug with something printed on it, something political, something apolitical, it probably started out as a product that started with Cafe Press. He has been an investor, and board member for FaceTime. If you don't know what FaceTime is, it is what Apple uses, and it was sold to Apple. PB Works and Photomoto. He's held a number of executive positions for Silicon Valley companies, like IntelliSync, which was bought by Nokia for over 450 million. We are very, very fortunate that he's currently passionate about Cal, I would say. He's been quite generous with Cal. He's been volunteering time to a number of Cal programs. So not only is he starting up his own venture, is he constantly working and advising other companies, but he has found time in a schedule to also be here tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mehdi Muksudnia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, it's, um, can you hear me back there? Um, it's a great pleasure to be back on campus. Um, I uh, left Berkeley um, more than 20 years ago. And um, uh, actually, my father, who's sitting in the audience, uh, was very unhappy about it. He wanted me to finish my master's and PhD. And, um, and I'm going to tell you a story of what happened and how did I leave. But um, uh, it's good to be back. I actually really, truly enjoy this campus. It was one of my best memories in life, and it still is. And some of my best friends are still here. They haven't left campus. They're still here, and they hang out, and I see them once in a while. But today, I was uh, thinking, um, how do I tell you what I learned in the 20 years um, and, and sort of pass to you, uh, you know, the sort of the, the experiences that I had? And I was going to put up a slide and, and put four things on it or three things on it and say, these are the three things I learned. And then I realized that if I do that, most of you probably see that all the time. Professors put up list, and, um, and it doesn't have context, and you don't get a feel for what really, how did you get to those lessons? So I'm going to tell you my story. It might be boring, but I'm going to tell you how I learned what I learned. Some of it you might want to repeat. Some of it you probably don't want to repeat. So um, first, I was one of these kids from an early age. Um, who always had questions. Um, so I was maybe five or six, and I had big questions, right? I, I was one of those kids who always asked, you know, wh how does this work? Why is this about? Uh, wh why does this thing function the way it does? And why am I here? Uh, one of the first big questions I had, which I, I still am, am extremely involved with and interested in, is, is what 
is the universe about? How big is it? Um, where are we? Why are we here? That has become a lifetime endeavor. So when I get extra time, I still sort of keep up with the latest cosmology studies and, and, and research because it's just fascinating to find out you know, how vast the universe is and you know, how small we are compared to it. It keeps you humble, keeps you grounded. The next question I asked, which I, I clearly remember because I think I was about seven or nine, and I asked my mom, um, you know, why was I born on this planet? Why not on some other planet? Um, and why you know, in this country and in this family? So it was like one of those questions which you know, at, a, at a young age I was asking very system-oriented questions, like why does this function this way? Um, now, that sort of questioning uh, continued in my life. So when I reached my teenage years, I started experimenting with real things, like uh, rewiring the electricity in our house, um, and resulted in a fire in our garage. Um, and I think I was maybe less than 11. Uh, the fire trucks came, and they put out the fire. And my parents were pretty um, you know, sort of uh, good about it. They, they didn't stop me. They let me experiment. So I, that experimentation went on. The next thing I did, I opened up our TV. Um, and I, I didn't know how to put it back together so it wouldn't work, but I was fascinated to sort of think about how the TV works. By the way, most of you guys don't realize TVs back then had you know, tubes and circuitry. And so I took away from that experiment something very important in my teenage years, which is um, my first lesson in life. Choose very carefully what problems you attack or try to solve. So I learned that not every problem is worth solving. Um, now, this is one of those lessons that I'm still learning. Honestly, I'm in my 40s, and I still take on problems that I shouldn't be taking on. Now, part of that is just your nature. You can't help it. But um, one of the things you should be very careful coming out of Berkeley, you've been trained as engineers. You've been trained as problem solvers. So the tool that the university gives you by definition, orients you towards solving problems, right? You, that, that becomes your nature. So you have to sort of be careful. Now, I had the misfortune of not only going to Berkeley, then I went to Stanford. I got degrees on engineering twice. And so my brain was wired to solve problems. And probably one of the things that I'm still learning um, in, in, in my uh, marriage uh, is not to solve problems. So you learn in your relationships that when your wife tells you something, she doesn't want you to solve it. She just wants you to listen. And my engineering brain still tries to solve it, and I get, you know, I sort of lose that battle every time, and I have to retrain myself. So for the guys in the audience, you have to turn off your engineering brain in certain times. You have to be careful about what you're trying to solve. So I ended up in Berkeley, um, you know, after high school. Uh, I went to Lincoln High in the city, ended up in Berkeley. Um, I actually wanted to go to Berkeley probably when I was like nine. And you know, I had a plan. I wanted to be in Berkeley. I knew the name of the professors. Uh, Richard Newton was one of my professors. Um, um, and so when I came here, it was an amazing experience for me. I mean, I probably really got my formal training about problem solving thinking, logistics, system thinking here on Berkeley. And to this day, uh, really, I, I consider that the best formation you know, the, the best impact to my neural network was here. That's how I got, you know, the training that I got. Um, and it was, I was an EECS major. Um, I did take a minor in uh, peace and conflict studies, uh, which was really sort of strange, going from a, uh, you know, engineering class to uh, the social sciences part, where everybody was talking about for hours how to prevent conflict in Israel and Palestine. And, it seemed to have gone in circles a hundred times, and there was no resolution to the problem. I also learned from that, which is, um, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, minute that you know, uh, the context within which you discuss problems actually impacts how you solve it. Um, but one of the things that I learned um, being in Berkeley was that everything around me was a system. And I, I'm sure a lot of you guys in this audience are st still thinking or beginning to think in that fashion, which is everything around you is a system. You know, everything from, from you know, the human body that you possess is a system um, to the economy. So I, I took an econ course, and I was actually frustrated because I wanted to learn how the economy works. And I realized um, as I went through the process that um, certain systems, although they were designed by us, 
they became organic systems, they evolved. They evolved so rapidly that the designers, us, we couldn't understand it. So I actually sat in classes with my professor and I realized that he didn't understand the global economy. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it was very clear that the system was so complex that you know, although we had designed it, it was a manufactured system, it had organically grown to be so complex that we couldn't and, and didn't understand how it actually functioned. So that got me really interested because I, I sort of started to think about there are you know, very highly structured systems and then there are organic systems. And highly structured systems are easy to understand, like the TV that I opened up. You know, years later, I sort of read the book. I understood how the TV works. It's a pretty enclosed system, simple to understand. Then I got fascinated with complex systems, um, global economy. Um, very hard to model, very hard to understand. And, and in fact, it sort of opens up, uh, if you do begin to understand, it gives you competitive advantages. So in my businesses that I've been involved with, the fact that I kept reading about the global economy, the fact that I understood better than some other people how it functioned, it gave me certain advantages in business as I did dealings, especially across, uh, you know, um, in, in other countries where the currency and the dynamics of the economy of that country matter. So I did deals um, in Israel and, and um, Bulgaria and Romania. So my understanding of how their economy was evolving um, actually gave me leverage in terms of how I made those negotiations. So understanding these complex systems actually helps you in, as, as you sort of get into um, uh, get into the real world and start you know, working around them. Um, there, there, are, there are also really amazing systems out there, complex systems that we are not even beginning to scratch the surface of. But what's interesting is when I was thinking about these systems 20 years ago in Berkeley, the tools to model these systems didn't exist. So this is one of the things that I learned um, early on. So I, I started uh, studying how ant colonies work, and i tell you why. Uh, because uh, I came out of the revolution in Iran. So I, when I was a young kid, my parents brought me out from, from Iran and we came to the US. And one of the things that really impacted me emotionally was the revolution in Iran. I, I saw people sort of change behavior overnight. And being the engineer in my mind, I was thinking, well, there must be an explanation as to why people behave. So I started um, studying uh, ant colonies. Um, and there was a fascinating uh, uh, set of studies done by a professor at the time in, um, in uh, a, 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 um, uh, Syracuse University in New York. Uh, she was studying how uh, when you put ant colonies under stress, uh, their behavior actually is predictable. So like, you know, certain ants get drowned, certain ants change their behavior and start helping out. So you could model the behavior of the ant colony under stress. So, um, I started when I was in Berkeley thinking, well, there must be a way to model human society um, and understand way, why a, a social structure under stress begins to behave differently. Why do the bonds break? So when you look at uh, you know, Katrina in, in New Orleans, you look at the revolution in Iran, uh, the structure of society, the bonds shatter. You know? um, people who were neighbors start shooting each other and start acting differently. So, so I started uh, uh, writing a rule-based system. How many of you guys here have, uh, have worked with rule-based systems? Raise, raise your arm. How many of you know like, systems like Lisp, Prolog, or have written any sort of modern rule-based engines? OK. So you know, I started thinking, well, there must be a way to capture that behavior in a rule-based system. So um, I, I took that challenge on and worked on the code and worked on the code. And essentially, 20 years ago, when I was trying to do this, the computing power wasn't there. And I failed miserably. So the model just it couldn't run. So I wrote all this code and put it on the computer. And the computers were so um, you know, sort of uh, uh, slow at the time that I couldn't even get through the, the uh, execution. Um, but what was interesting is that actually got me a job at Bell Labs. <laughs> so that, that sort of experimentation um, all they failed completely. Um, they read my paper and they said, well, you, we have a lot of computers here. Why don't you come uh, work on a rule-based system, uh, but not for modeling uh, social behavior. Uh, you know, although it's interesting to find out when a revolution might happen, it would be much more interesting to find out how um, NTT has designed their chipset. <laughs> so AT&T at the time wanted to know 
um, you know, they, they had taken the, the uh, NTT uh, chipset, which was a, a switching technology. They had cut the silicon, but they couldn't tell what the design was. So they wanted to write a rule-based system for figuring out the design. And uh, Bell Labs at the time was like, um, you know, um, basically a, a Google of our time, right? They gave you unlimited budget and computers and free lunch, and they said, go at it. Um, so, so I sort of did that for a year. I got extremely bored because I felt like all it was interesting, uh, it had a lot of politics around it. So by now, I had learned two lessons in my life, which is very important. One is um, it's very, very important um, you know, to choose the problem well. Um, but the second lesson that I got out of it, um, which was very important, is um, in order to solve big problems, it's, it takes more than ideas. Um, it actually takes... Um, teams and tools. This was a big lesson. So um, I took on the idea of sort of modeling society. I didn't have the computing power. I went to AT&T. Uh, they gave me the computing power, but I didn't have the right team. People were just too academic. They were not really trying to solve something in a structured way from, from where I was sitting. And so I came back to the Valley, and, and I applied those lessons. So, I, I, so I, I decided, OK, well, let's choose a problem that's worth solving. Um, and then let's choose the tools and the teams that en enables you to so solve that problem. And this is so important. I don't know how else to tell you that you could waste so much of your time choosing the wrong problem or attacking it with the wrong tool and the wrong team. Um, so what happened is this is metaphor computer system, which none of you guys will remember. This is 1990. Um, and at the time, uh, Procter and Gamble and Coca-Cola uh, needed to know how many of their products they sold were in the U.S. This is 1990, so um, they came to us and said, "Hey, we need to know how many, um, you know, shampoos you're selling in California versus Idaho." And at the time, the the network didn't exist, the internet. Um, computers uh, were, you know, basically DOS machines, so the average employee at Procter and Gamble couldn't use it. Um, Query languages, databases didn't exist. So we as a team set on to create that platform. That was all done from scratch by us, um, a team of 100 people. So we built wireless keyboards, mouses, operating system, printers, uh, windowing system. We built a networking system. Um, so we built everything um, from scratch with 100 people. This is coming out of AT&T with thousands of people. We built all of that in two years. And, and Procter and & Gamble and Coca-Cola deployed it, and IBM bought us out. Two years later, IBM bought the company for $120 million and, and went on to shut it down <laughs> because they were scared that it would cannibalize their business. Now, it's very interesting. Every person who worked on that workstation is now running a major company in the US. So um, Marketo, Phil, was a partner there, was a, was a member. Uh, Debbie Meredith at uh, Jafco was a partner there. Uh, the guys who write the uh, Firefox browser, David Benveni and those guys, were, were engineers in that firm. So all of us spread out and started doing other things that were really interesting. But what, the lesson that I got out of this is with the right team and tool, you can do a lot. You can build a lot of stuff very quickly and solve big problems. Um, but uh, I also learned another lesson out of this, which is um, you know, uh, to, to have that problem become sustainable, um, the solution that you build uh, to become sustainable, you have to be able to uh, finance it long term. So one of the things out of that experience is I, I sort of went to Stanford. Sorry to say, I, I, at the time I felt like I didn't understand financing as well. So I went to Stanford for masters um, and, and started sort of trying to understand better um, the, the financing business aspect of, of the startups um, environment. So I was at Stanford for about a year and a half. And um, the lesson that I took out of Stanford was that um, storytelling um, is very, very powerful. Um, so let me tell you so, so what happened here. So at Stanford, we created a company uh, that we were trying to finance called Presidio. And, and I started uh, going out there trying to raise money for Presidio. And I realized that um, depending on how you tell the story, people's behavior is very different. So I got fascinated with storytelling as an invention. How, how, how do stories work? And I put this up because you guys know this intuitively. The most powerful invention that we have ever, have ever done on the planet 
is, is um, the invention of the story of religion, right? It has, has moved things in an amazing fashion on a global basis, right? People um, you know, do amazing things. They kill themselves just in the name of a story that they heard, right? That, the power of that story is amazingly effective. And it has gone on for thousands of years. So if you were to invent something as, a, as an engineer, if you had invented this story that lasts that long and influences so many people as a product, it's pretty powerful. So, so I started getting very interesting about, interested about what, what, how do you tell a story? What's the impact of a story? Um, how do people listen to a story, right? Um, and this was very important because I realized that um, everything I, I need to do to make um, my vision come true outside of engineering and team building and tools a big part of it is storytelling. Like, if you can't tell the story, you can't raise money, right? So people follow you, people invest into you, not necessarily based on just, you know, it is a factor of who you are and the market and so on and so forth, but a lot of it is the story you tell. People want to believe in something to follow you, right? So the way you tell that story has the power to bring along um, you know, investors, and, or it has the power of sort of turning them off. So the, the way you tell a story is very powerful. You, you tell a story to the team. So this is one of the things that I've been doing for the past 20 years, is when I hire people, a lot of your management skill is about telling the story. And people do incredible things if they believe in that mission, if they feel like they're part of that team. Um, so, so, you know, I have seen this... Um, in, in, in real time, I, I've been in um, situations where uh, there was a team in place, um, they were not succeeding. Uh, one of those companies was, um, uh, was Cafe Press, uh, which, which we mentioned. So it was a company founded by two guys. Um, when I joined them to help them out, um, the team that was there was disillusioned. Someone wanted to leave. And within a year, the team that was almost quitting was, uh, was, you know, took the company from zero to 130 million revenue. So that team was so dedicated, so committed. And the only thing that had changed in a, in a matter of 12 months was really the content, the story that you told the team. Why are they there? What are they solving? Why is this interesting? Why is this powerful? And it's very interesting. Before we told the right story, they thought they were there because they were just like printing t-shirts and printing mugs. And, and it was actually pretty complex problem to solve. So I don't, I don't think people quite understood. Before Cafe Press, um, there was no way to print a copy of a t-shirt. So if you had to do a screen printing of t-shirts, for example, or mugs, you have to go to someone and commit to a volume. So Gap would go to someone, a screen printer, and say, I want 1,000 copies of this t-shirt. So we wanted to be able to print a single t-shirt of a certain color on any size uh, that you desired and do it within 24 hours. So, there were engineers trying to figure out how to dry ink on a fabric that came from India. And the ink wouldn't dry fast enough. So we had to control the humidity in the room. And, and we had to actually spend a million dollars designing a printer in Israel that would deposit the ink on the fabric and not have the head get stuck because the next t-shirt was not on a pink fabric, was on a black fabric. And the color had to change. And so the ink couldn't dry on the tip of the printer. So this was all sort of technology we're inventing, and it was hard, it was like frustrating, right? You could print a thousand copies, it wouldn't come out right, people didn't want to pay for it. So we changed the story, we said, hey, you're not doing this just to print a t-shirt. There is a mom in Kansas who has lost her job, and she has a talent, her talent is to design, but she can't really run a business. She doesn't have the talent to raise money, she can't open a store, she doesn't have the money to rent a store. But if you let her upload her design to your site and sell it, you just created the business for her. And this actually was happening, right? So people were uploading their designs, they were selling them, they were making money, and they were writing us letters on the customer support channel saying, until today, I didn't know how to make money. Now I'm excited. I'm sitting up all night designing so that I can create my own business. One of those people, um, <clears throat> his name was uh, Jim Gamble. He was an anthropologist. He quit his job, and a year later was making a million dollars a year on selling political t-shirts. So, so what I did is I went to the customer support team, grabbed the story, brought it back, and told the engineers, you're doing this to help Jim. You're doing this to help 
Susan, you're doing this to help Jill. And that story became a very powerful story, right? Now you had, you had an incentive. You felt like, oh, wow, I'm changing people's lives. It means something. And, and they did incredible things. I mean, that team developed things that I honestly, I didn't think it was possible. I was challenging them. I said, you know, you need to go do this. And then I left the room thinking, there's no way in hell they could do this. Like, they can't really figure out how to dry ink on the fabric in 24 hours. And they would literally come back. One of the engineers figured a way to print anything on a mug using a um, deconstructed microwave. <laughs> I don't know how he did that, but he came over one weekend and said, I figured it out, I figured it out. And he had constructed, he had taken the gut of a microwave and using the microwave engine, he could dry ink on a mug. And he came back and he figured out and we scaled it. We made it into a production where we were doing about 10 million of mugs a year on his microwave engineered design. That actually makes sense. Yeah. Because you well, electricity through the air. Yeah, and dries it up. <laughs> yeah, afterwards we, we understood how he did it. But <laughs> it was a pretty incredible, uh, you know, what, what people come up with. That, that's another thing that, that I am just amazed, and I, I, I honestly don't think there's a limit to it. People are capable of doing amazing things if you put them in the right um, sort of ecosystem, in the right structure. Um, the, th the other thing I learned about um, storytelling is you can't get deals done um, unless you can tell a story. So every, every important uh, deal that I've done in my life, either in terms of partnership, acquisitions, IPOs, anything, um, a lot of it goes back to storytelling. And that doesn't mean that the deal is sustainable to stories, but people don't get into a relationship unless there's a story that they believe in. And, and this is important. So when you go to, um, you know, you want to take a company public, uh, essentially the, you know, the bankers are listening to your story and they're trying to tell your story to the buy side, right? There, there are institutions who are sitting there saying, I want to buy something interesting. Your banker has to walk into a room. There are lots of choices. They can buy any one of the following stocks. He has to tell your story and tell it better than you know, the other guys in the room are telling a story. So unless you can tell that story and get the guys excited, they can't sell your story to the buy side. If you're doing a deal with someone, um, you know, you call um, the, you know, I, I had to do a deal with um, Ingram Industries, uh, which is, uh, how many people know Ingram Industries? Okay, Ingram Industries is one of the oldest businesses in the US. It runs out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Martha Ingram is probably the second or third richest woman in the US. The family owns the barges that Washington used to uh, carry food up the, um, you know, up the river to fight the British. Uh, they still own the barges, but they also own the largest distribution of content. So if you have uh, newspapers in your library or journals, it probably came from Ingram. Um, if you have textbooks, it's probably shipped through Ingram. So they have a massive business, about six billion a year. So when you want to do a deal with someone um, like that that has been around for 100 years, you have to tell a story that fits their, their business model, right? You can't walk in and say, I want to do a deal with you. Um, you know, I'm some guy from California, and um, you know, my name is Mary Maxudnia. You can't even spell it. Let's do a deal, right? You have to sort of tell a story. The story has to be interesting. They have to sort of believe that you know, within the context of how they think, the story makes sense to them. That's how partnerships are done. Um, and so you have to get very good at this if you want to solve problems. And this actually applies to every one of you guys, probably in the projects you're doing as a team. So if you have conflicts within your team, that's always a sign that you're, you're not on the same page about what narrative you're, you're pursuing. What is it that you're trying to achieve and are you aligned? Um, so I, I'm going to finish with one thing. So I, I learned, I learned Focus on the problem you're trying to solve. Make sure you have the right team and the right tool around you. Um, and, and be very good at storytelling. Set the context of what it is you're trying to do. And the last thing I want to say that um, has, has been a problem for me personally, and I think uh, I see it a lot, is don't let your ego get on the way. Um, so this is hard, because um, when you actually do things um, that, are, that are effective, People tend to cluster around you, and then your ego gets boosted, right? You feel like, oh, wow, I'm, I must be like, you know, I'm doing something interesting. And then that's when you're the most vulnerable, right? <laughs> when your ego gets out of control, 
uh, you lose perspective. Uh, so, so it's actually a very dangerous thing. So I have learned uh, as a defensive mechanism, when I have people working with me and they compliment me too much, I feel uh, a sense of danger. I feel like, okay, the, they, they are like putting me into a bubble. And so your ego gets inflated. When your ego gets inflated, you don't see things around you. And then you, you, you know, you're vulnerable. You have to be paranoid enough to know what's going on around you. And ego is a dangerous thing. You have to, be, you have to put it under check all the time. So um, I'm going to finish with um, three suggestions and, and things that I think you guys, first, I have to say, you're in a far more exciting position than we were when we graduated, right? Because I had to, uh, and the engineers of my generation and the business you know, majors of my generation had to develop a lot of foundation. So every generation gets the benefit of the previous generation's foundational work, right? So when we started, we didn't have Google and, and we didn't have you know, data analytics and computers and the way you guys have. So a lot of what we spend time on is just really getting, I mean, I, I remember my first job out of Berkeley was getting the pixels right on the screen. It was not a fun job. I mean, getting a document to show up on a screen and the pixel wouldn't show, and the chip wasn't designed well, and we had to call Intel and say, oh, you know, location, you know, pixel on, on coordinate X, Y doesn't show and doesn't light up. And it just, it was a messy, completely sort of waste of time in terms of, uh, you know, high value um, productive work. You guys are, are in a totally different space. I mean, you can do things we couldn't dream of. Like the projects that I took on trying to model social behavior, you can now probably pull it off on your iPhone. You have enough computing power. Um, so you guys have a lot more tools um, you know, in front of you that we didn't, have, we didn't have at our time. So I think having said that, you guys now should focus on solving a bunch of things that's really worth um, digging into. The biggest problem we face and your generation faces, unfortunately, more than mine, I'm, I'm now, you know, uh, I, I'm less affected by this, but you guys will be hugely affected by this. Government just does not work. And a lot of people know this. Uh, but there's a, there's, a, there's a systematic reason why it doesn't work. Um, societies are now extremely complex. And the way we run government is, is completely sort of broken in terms of their ability to understand complex systems. So as a generation that's going to graduate, and you guys, you guys will be armed by one of the best schools on the planet to be problem solvers, right? You, you are the elite. Um, group of people who intellectually can solve problems. So unfortunately, you will inherit this issue. You have, on a global basis, governments that are under uh, sort of, um, uh, they, they have an underinvestment in terms of the ability to solve these issues. And I want to make sure they're not good, bad people. I mean, I, I, meet, I meet a lot of these people who do fundraising. Um, wonderfully good intention, good people. But you can't run a government of this complexity uh, with 20 interns in Washington trying to deal with 100 problems with no real data analytics and system thinking in the government. So our governments today are, are trying to solve a jet engine with a hammer, right? The people might be well-intentioned, but they just don't have the tools. And unfortunately, a lot of people who run for government, they don't have the training. They're not system thinkers. They're not engineers. They don't approach the problem in a holistic fashion. They approach the problem in a transactional fashion. So they approach the latest thing in front of them, and they don't spend a lot of time thinking about the impact uh, on a global basis. So that's one of the areas where I think you guys as a generation have to seriously think about, because it impacts everything, right? It impacts uh, our policies. It impacts you know, how we sort of manage uh, distribution of you know, well, distribution of health you know, coverage. Everything else comes down to, are we making intelligent decisions in, in government? And, and um, I think actually can be solved, but it has to be solved by people uh, designing systems uh, that, that sort of show data and, and make data uh, decision making easier at the government level. Um, the next thing uh, that's very important is biology. Um, so for those of you who are in the engineering department, next 20 years, we are, we are cracking really understanding how to make living machines, right? We are, we are beginning to understand how to design living machines. This was not possible uh, 20 years ago. And, and it is amazingly powerful. So I wish I was at, at where you're sitting right now in, in those seats at your age, and I would be like, you know, 
devouring the information coming out of uh, life sciences in terms of you know, how the genetics of, of living cells work and how the mechanism of the cell works and how do we get these amazing um, sort of living machines to do what we want them to do. Um, it's both scary but extremely powerful. Um, we have never had this level of control. Um, the, so so this, is, this might be a bit too much for this lecture, but think about uh, we, we have been designing extremely structured systems, right? So we as, as engineers, as, as, as innovators, um, are, are sort of very naive in our designs compared to Mother Nature, right? Mother Nature creates highly redundant systems, right? Um, we as engineers create highly um, sort of structured and, and simplistic machines, right? Um, so our designs often fail because there, there is no uh, sort of organic uh, element to that design. And we, by the way, we do this across the board. Human beings generally do this. Our, our, our companies are structured, our institutions are structured. And, and as engineers, you understand that highly structured designs tend to be uh, extremely sensitive to, they have, they have many single points of failure. They're, like, they're, they're not, they're not um, robust. Where organic systems uh, tend not to be efficient, but they're highly redundant and robust, right? So that's a, that's a whole discussion about, as you design things, you have to almost tolerate um, uh, a level of, of inefficiency to get that redundancy. Now this is gonna come to you as you become leaders. So one of these days you're gonna be in a company and, and you know, people would tell you that certain things you're doing in that company is wasteful. You should rain down cost and structure things and don't let people wander. And you, you begin to realize that the more you squeeze things and discipline things, the more fragile they become. Highly structured designs are very fragile. So in a, in a funny way, you have to tolerate some randomness, some chaos to get redundancy, to get robustness. Um, so um, as we learn how Mother Nature has designed living machines, we're beginning to both appreciate the design but also appreciate the, the sort of level of redundancy that these systems have. Um, and and you know, how, how interesting a set of machines you can create with these um, living machines versus our structured engineering approach today. Um, and the third thing is education. So um, I, I think this is, um, this is an area where, again, for your generation is essential. So um, first of all, you, you guys realize that we're now up to seven billion people um, and going to about nine soon, nine billion people on this planet. Um, the educational system you guys are experiencing today was designed for a population of about 20 million. So this notion of somebody getting up and lecturing you guys uh, was designed for the elite, right? It was a, it was a system uh, you know, designed maybe a couple of hundred years ago to teach the, the, the sons and daughters and you know, people of privilege, right? It was not designed for a scalable uh, planet the way we need to educate people. And I'm not saying that in, in, a, in a negative way. I'm not criticizing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazingly impressed with what universities do in the US. By the way, we have the best university system anywhere on the planet. The problem is we can't scale it fast enough. There are too many people who need to get educated they can't fit into this classroom. What Berkeley does today with you guys needs to be done at a massive scale to educate the people on the planet. And if we don't educate the people on the planet, we have a serious problem on our hand because you know, everything down the line is an impact, it, it, it gets impacted by education. And this has been proven many, many times over. So if you do not get educated at a young age, you're more likely to be poor malnutrition. You know, your society will get impacted. Everything down the line results in, in impact to society. So education is fundamental, especially given, given the growing population. Now, unfortunately, most people we need to educate aren't in the developed world. You know, they're in you know, India and China, and, and you know, they're hard to reach. So education as a system needs to be redesigned. And, um, and you know, it's, a, it's a hard problem because you know, how do you grab the quality of education you have at Berkeley and scale it? You know, there, you're seeing some of, the, some of the ideas out there like MOOCs, which I, you know, sort of MOOCs represent like uh, first generation PCs. I'm not sure that's the outcome, but it's an interesting riff. It's an interesting uh, beginning to think about how do you extend 
the value of education to people who might not be physically here. So this is an area that, that's worth digging into. By the way, education, for those of you um, business-minded, it's a $1.2 trillion industry in the US alone. It's the third largest after energy and healthcare. So as a business, massive business, right? It's, it's interesting to think about how do you change, change the, the dynamics of business. And it's a $1.2 trillion business uh, only reaching uh, less than you know, about 50 million people. So it tells you the scale of this business, right? So we're not even reaching that many people and it's a massive business in the US. Um, so it's, it's worth thinking about how do you grab this product called education and, and scale it to others in the world in a, in a more sort of uh, effective fashion. Um, so I, I end with that. And if, I don't know if you guys have any Q&A or questions or anything that I can answer. Any questions? Can I um, just bring a mic so you can hear it a little bit better? Thank you. Out of all the Out of all the startups and projects you've worked with, which has been your favorite or which has been the one that's most interesting to you? Um, it's hard to say because uh, every one of them uh, in some way touches you. You know, it's like, it's like your kids. Uh, and by the way, uh, my kids are sitting in the back over there. Um, they're sort of uh, watching their dad. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I tell you, the, the thing, what gives you satisfaction uh, in, in solving these problems, like at Cafe Press, when, when I felt like uh, the single mom in, in Idaho or Kansas could start a business online through our platform with no money down and just uploading a design and, and getting a couple of thousand a month, that really makes you happy, right? That, that feels like you, you, you almost feel like you're on a mission, right? That, that person had interesting designs. They went to Gap. Gap said, sorry, we only choose two guys per year because we need to print a thousand copies. And then you suddenly give them a platform and they're making you know, a couple of thousand a month selling to their niche audience, which is a totally valid audience. This long tail effect in the market is real. And you guys live it because your generation probably has more diversity in the music they listen to than any generation before. Because in the past, you had a couple of choices at the, at the record store, right? You could buy this or buy that. You guys are now used to just, I want to download whatever I want to listen to. So bringing the, you know, empowering people to take their art and sell it online was very satisfying. At Book Render, the reason I got into it was because the students couldn't afford the textbooks. And when I saw the, the platform that could make the textbook be rentable, that just, the satisfaction brought to those students was awesome. Right? That's the reason I, I thought that, you know, when you have that sort of emotional need in the market, it tends to bring organic growth. So this is another thing that when you solve a real problem for people, um, your, your solution tends to track uh, you know, viral growth because it, it emotionally impacts people, right? Do you have ideas for how to create a culture within the tech community where people don't get blocked by ego, why their self, the sense of self-worth is based on the people that support them, but not you know, their personal achievement. Because I would love to see that kind of change happen. Within say, I'm sorry, industry. say that one more time. Like, so within, like, <clears throat> do you have ideas for how to create a culture where people's sense of self-worth is not based on ego in the tech industry? Because I see that you yourself find a way to defend against ego. But how do you create a team where everybody is working to support each other and not for their own ego? So first, I don't think I've solved the issue for myself. I know, I, do you I, have ideas? It's a work it? in progress. I, I have many ego problems. <laughs> um, I, so uh, how do you do it for the team? Um, you know, uh, if, if, if the question is when, when you build a team, <clears throat> um, the, the more flatter the team is, the, the better it functions. Hierarchies generally are, are not. So my, my personal experience is um, I do not ever in a team produce hierarchy. This is hard to understand. But like people come to me and say, well, I want to be a VP. I want to be a senior director. 
And, and you know, we, I have a policy, which is we do not assign titles to people. Um, you earn titles. Now, th that's easy to say and hard to implement, but generally, um, you know, in, in lar the larger the team gets, um, people um, gravitate towards leaders based on execution. And if you watch that, it makes it easier to create the right dynamic within teams. If you create hierarchies, then it backfires. If you assign somebody, you're now the chief product officer, and the rest of the team doesn't respect them, it backfires. So um, in some ways, um, if you let org team dynamics be organic, it tends to be healthier. Um, but that's the only thing I've learned. In terms of the general solution to ego, um, I honestly think that's, a f that's just a part of our nature. The other thing that I, maybe it's important for you to understand is we, we, we are very flawed as a species. So the sooner you accept that, the easier life becomes because you can hypothetically in your mind design an ideal system based on us not being us, but the reality is we are not, we are, we are just yet another animal on the planet and we have lots of flaws around us. So it's easy as an engineer to accept who we are as a human beings and then design your system with that in mind. So, and I don't wanna get political here, but like in the early days of my undergrad, I, I read Marx, Engels, and you know, Communist Manifesto, and I was fascinated with the notion of you know, equal distribution. And then you know, it struck me very early on, like the conceptual model is fascinating, but it's impossible to implement with human beings being human beings. So again, it's one of those system design issues where you have to realize who you're working with. We are who we are, <laughs> and the sooner you accept those flaws, you can work around them versus trying to engineer as if you're ideal species, right? You're not. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I'm really interested in the problem education that you talked about. I think except for the scalability problem, we also have this problem like the um, speeds of which um, we are educated is a lot slower than the information that's generated. Do you, like based on your experience, do you have any suggestion of how we could selectively absorb information, how the education system could be designed to better, like to improve the speed? That, that's, oh, yeah. a, that's a fantastic observation. So you're absolutely right. Uh, so one of the things that's happening uh, to us as a society is the rate of uh, innovation, the rate of information is exceeding our ability today, given our educational system, uh, to just, um, you know, to, to catch up. And so it's creating a, a, a huge sort of um, uh, problem in terms of you, you become uh, focused. You have to quickly focus on a subtopic. And that focus on subtopic effectively uh, takes away scope out of your understanding. Um, so one of the problems that you, you find out very quickly when you assemble a group of people, a team to work on something, is they might all be experts in their topic, but their understanding of the whole system is so limited. Um, and it's getting worse. Having a, a, the understanding of everything about a given system, like when we talk about the global economy, trying to have a, a team that understands how it functions and design a system is becoming extremely hard. And, and unfortunately, it's bifurcating people, meaning there are a bunch of people whose CPUs run at a very high megahertz. I don't know if you guys use that. You know. Certain people just think faster. They can keep up and, and understand the system, and certain people are inherently think slower, but they might understand the topic deeper. They have a harder time being holistic thinkers about the system. And, and managing that is, is getting hard, even within companies and teams, it's getting hard, right? Because you have a discussion, and you realize some people in the room don't understand the big picture, but they understand an area really well, and the vice versa, which is people who understand the big picture don't really can't have the time and patience to understand the specifics of the challenge in that area. I, I actually, one of the things I struggled in my last management job was in, in meetings identifying, this is a problem worth solving, quickly identifying which type are you and how to manage the conversation to have both sides listen to each other. Because so what happens is holistic thinkers, system thinkers tend to have very good long-term strategies, but they don't see the ditch in front of them. So this is like, you know, you quickly can figure out how the market is moving. I can tell you that, you know, in two years, um, 
uh, you know, prediction in two years, you know, um, textbooks are gone, the obvious prediction. You're gonna go ebooks. Not two years, five years, six years, whatever it is. The problem with that holistic thinking is because you can't understand the specifics of an area, you forget the ditch in front of you. And so you need someone in your team who is an expert. And then you have to listen to them. But the expert tends not to see the big picture. So that conversation breaks down very quickly. Because half of the time they might say things that are not relevant. They lose value within the team. So the team puts them aside. And then the team runs into the ditch. <laughs> so managing that conversation becomes very tricky. It's actually a big challenge right now. Uh, which events led to your decision to leave grad school? Uh, uh, I made the, uh, it probably was a mistake, I want to say. I, I, I got a check. So I implemented a system when I was at Stanford. Um, I implemented a system for um, uh, collecting and analyzing uh, clinical data uh, on drugs. And um, a VP from uh, Sharing Plow uh, saw the application and wrote us a check for $300,000. So I was young enough and naive enough that I you know, sort of uh, left and didn't finish my uh, master's and, and started a company, which I then sold um, to BBN. But in, in, in hindsight, I want to say um, I, I, wasn't, you know, I didn't have this sort of, you guys are growing up in a much more sophisticated environment. At the time, um, $300,000 from a VP at Sharing Plow was a big deal, right? Now I have to tell you, um, your time and your focus matters a lot more than the money that people throw at you. So it's very important to understand money is actually very cheap and, and, and it, there's plenty of it out there. Your time is not recoverable. So uh, you know, as you get excited about projects, that's why I said be very careful about the time you spend on problems. Choose the problems carefully and, and always remember in the back of your head that your IQ, your intelligence, your time is far more valuable than anybody's money. You're doing them a favor, they're not doing you a favor, <laughs> right? So if somebody pays you to do something, you have to ask yourself, is this worth my IQ and time, right? Because you have to make that decision independent of, of the amount. Um, and it's a tough one. I mean, I, I see entrepreneurs who get, you know, they get excited, somebody gave them a million dollars. Like this morning, I met with one of my friends who is 27. And he raised a million dollars, he's solving this problem, he's excited, and I'm sitting there, I have to sort of in a very nice way tell him, is this really worth your time? I mean, that money is gonna run out, but is this really worth solving? Is this a problem where you're gonna walk away 10 years from now and say, I really, it was worth solving. I wanted to give, give it my all, right? So for a group of people pursuing the entrepreneurship, one of the most, most horrible stories is just about stealing your idea and stealing your te technology, right? Like the big firm had a partnership with you, and like they steal your idea, or they replicate exactly the same technology, or investor kick you out of the board and just let other guys just to pursue exactly the same technology. And like that kind of horrible stories wonder me, like how much credibility um, should I have? And like what is a general recommendation um, to deal with kind of like negotiation or the conversation, the very, very initial stage conversation to engage in as an as a entrepreneur? So, um, you know, stealing people's ideas, um, yeah, I want to be uh, careful. So, so ideas, you know, at any given point when you come up with an idea, you have to assume that 10 other people uh, just around you had the same idea, or if not here within a broader uh, range of population, right? Ideas are not that unique often. Uh, you know, so you build your ideas on top of other people's ideas. So ideas are, are, are by definition incremental. You know, people, Uber, um, you know, when Uber was, was designed, 10 other people were doing Uber. When Yelp came about, there were 15 people doing Yelp. So, it's not like somebody wakes up today and says, oh, I, I want to come up with a notion of listing businesses no one else has thought about. You know? um, the difficult thing is execution. So you know, uh, I, I met a lot of these guys at the early days, and you're sitting across them, and you have to decide, do you invest in, you know, out of the 10 teams, which one of the teams do you invest in? So that goes back to my, my conversation that the, the tools and the teams you surround with, yourself with um, 
could, could result in you executing well or failing. Far more important than the idea itself, right? So ideas um, are, 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 are interesting. You should have an idea, you should explore it, but really execution is the key. So my suggestion to you is if you have a great idea, don't be shy about sharing it. Focus on executing, and execution really comes down to do I have the right tools and do I have the right team? And if you have those two things, that's, that's really the best defense, is to, to go forward as fast as possible to win. But holding your idea close to your chest and thinking it's unique uh, is not, right? Momentum, so another way to think about it is Mother Nature actually tells you this, momentum matters, right? So if you don't have momentum as a living thing, you're dead. Companies are the same. You know, ideas are the same. If you don't have momentum, you're dead, right? It's a living thing. If you don't put force and life into it and it's not moving, it, it's not worth it. Yeah. Uh, I'll take two more questions. So I have one down there. I haven't gone over there yet. Um, when you said that um, your project where you created like the wireless keyboard uh, and things like that was bought out and then shut down by another company, um, did you feel any like ownership to that project or did you feel like that was a failure or a success or like how did you view that at the time? Um, no, I, I mean, these are emotional things. We still have the metaphor reunion. <laughs> 20 years later, we still get together and have coffee. So when you create something like that, you, it becomes a part of you, right? And um, it's funny because um, like I, in fact, I got an email from one of the engineers like two months ago who um, sent me a picture of, of a, a query window that IBM just prototyped for one of the customers. And he, was, he put a note laughing saying, we did this 20 years ago and they had it and they shut it down. So um, you know, once you create something and, and someone takes it on and you don't see it achieving its full potential, it emotionally bothers you. Um, but it happens a lot. So, I, I unfortunately, again, part of our nature is we're not highly optimized as, as, as just who we are, right? We, we make a lot of mistakes. And I think you have to sort of accept that uh, part of your role as an engineer, as a product person, is you are uh, building these uh, platforms for the next generation to build on top of. So everything we did at that company, the engineers left and did it in other companies, so, right? So you see that propagation of that knowledge and information going out there, unfortunately, just doesn't have your name on it anymore. It's like, okay. It goes back to that ego part. <laughs> you know, you're still impacting the world, but doesn't have your name on it. Question over here. Make it a good one. Thanks. Hi there. So, um, so I've seen that you, you're the founder of uh, um, the Combustion Ventures, and you guys are an incubator. So I was just going to say, you guys have applicants who apply to you, and you guys give them 100 grand of funding. So what specifics do you look for, um, like characteristic-wise, um, in entrepreneurs coming in, like applying to, being, to be in your incubator? So, you know, the investments that we make are all, um, first of all, we, we, uh, you know, we focus on consumer deals. 99% is consumer deals, meaning we're solving a problem for the end consumer. Um, and, you know, the way you, you decide on what to do, again, goes back to, First, it has to be a problem worth solving. So when, when you pitched, and this is not, I, by the way, this is not me, this is in general. Uh, when you approach investors uh, or anybody who in the, in the Valley, in, in the overall tech market wants to do something, the first question should be in their mind and usually is, is this worth solving? Is this a problem that people are suffering from and, and, and the pain is real? And there's a lot of language for this. Is it a you know, must have, nice to have, is it a, vitamin or aspirin or you know, people describe it different ways. But the problem has to be clear and, and you have to identify that it matters to people. Um, second thing you, you ask yourself is the market big enough, right? Uh, so the pain might be very real, but the market might not be big enough. The pain might apply to five people, six people, right? Um, so you have to identify both that the pain is real and the market is big enough to sustain a solution. Um, that's a very tough thing to understand because if it's not sustainable, you know, I, I personally, um, uh, you know, want to really solve the problem. I don't want to put a bandage on it. So if you create solutions that are not sustainable, you're almost like a, 
sort of semi nonprofit, you're going to do it for a while, then you lose interest, you walk away, and it doesn't get solved. So it has to be sustainable by the, by the ecosystem. And then the third thing you look for is um, the team. You know, are you guys the right team to solve it? Which is, you know, it's a combination of your skill set, who you are, how you think. Is this a match with your competencies? Um, those are the things you look for in teams um, to decide if they can actually win. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You